Today's video is one that I'm very excited to make, and that's where I finally set up a product in my smart home environment that I've wanted for a very long time. And that is a small in-wall touchscreen that lets me control my lighting and other devices in the room from a single touchscreen on the wall that's, you know, recessed, powered by the mains, and not some sort of like wall-mounted Android tablet or something that's a lot more complicated than I would need and you have issues with batteries in them and stuff like that. I just wanted a small LCD panel on the wall, a couple inches in size, that I can just use to control lights, pick scenes, stuff like that. Now over the years I've been researching various options, looking at different products, and there's just been nothing available on the market. There's been people making them, but they've used homebrew projects, they've used like Arduinos and ESP chips with LCD screens and 3D printed enclosures and stuff like that. But I didn't want to go to all that effort. What I wanted was an off-the-shelf product that I could buy, potentially flash custom firmware on, and have the device. However, recently I finally came across an option that seems like a perfect solution to this sort of, this sort of problem. And that's this which is the Lanbon L8 LCD smart switch. But what this seems to be is just a very basic LCD smart switch. And we'll turn it on and take a look at the user interface on it as, as standard. And to be honest, I can't really see the point of it. It gets pretty bad reviews on Amazon. And the interface just seems to be three buttons that control three relays. And you can like rename them on the screen. And like, I think there's maybe a bit of timer functionality and it can connect to Wi-Fi and connect to their cloud and you can get a to your smart life variant and stuff like that. But yeah, the, the device itself out of the box is pretty hopeless. However, when I mentioned that people make these sort of screens themselves, they do, they do DIY projects, there's a piece of open source firmware designed for that called OpenHasp. And OpenHasp is designed for people making these sort of their, home their own touch screens using their own enclosures and stuff like that, but generally where they're using an ESP32 microcontroller and an SPI LCD screen. We'll take a look at this when we open it up, but it just so happens that when they've designed this product, it also has an ESP32 microcontroller connected to, to an, S, connected to an SPI touchscreen. That means that OpenHasp is actually available to flash onto this. So we can take this, flash on the open source OpenHasp firmware, and that makes it super easy to create a custom user interface on that screen in the wall just by writing a JSON file. And then it'll talk over MQTT to Node-RED. You could also use Home Assistant if you prefer that. And I can integrate it perfectly with my smart home. Now this is obviously going to be a very long video, so what I'll do as usual is I'll put timestamps in the, in the description as well as in the video seek bar. But what we'll do is first of all we'll open this up, take a look at the product, power it up just for a laugh just with its stock firmware to see what it's like, it's, it's not great. Then we'll open it up, take a look inside, we'll then flash the OpenHasp firmware onto it, I'll install it in my wall, I'll go away and do a bit of configuration to get the user interface designed, and I'll come back and give a tour of it. So first things first, let's unbox it and see what we get. So this is it here. These are available from Amazon or AliExpress and various other places. So I'll put some links down in the description and in a pinned comment. But this only costs £50. And you can probably get it cheaper if you buy it from abroad, but yeah, £50 for this thing is very inexpensive for what it is. Especially given the time it saves over trying to build something custom. So we'll open it up. I'll take a look. So, very generic box. Presumably lots of amusing English on it. Not actually too much bad stuff, although Wi-Fi mesh, I don't know how this thing meshes, but anyway, um, yeah, pair of generic box, pop it open, foam, basic stuff on how to wall mount it, essentially it's that standard thing like my thermostat where you've got a front plate that connects onto a back plate, and that just shows how to assemble it, you get the touchscreen switch itself, it's available in both black and white, I've gone for the white version, but you could go for a black version if you, if you prefer that, and the black version would potentially look better when it's off because it'll blend in with the screen, but on my wall it's a very light coloured wall so I wanted the white one. You get the rear part, which we'll take a look at in a second. And you get a couple of accessories, so you get the instructions that I've literally not even looked at yet. Just a sort of user guide on how to work the user interface really. We won't have to be using any of that, but we'll take a look at it just for a laugh. Some sort of roadmap style ma manual that's just, yeah, how to connect it to, how to wire it up and stuff like that, which, yeah, nothing that useful really. Um, they do a few different options actually, yeah, there's the, I forgot about that, there's the boil, there's a boiler version and a dimmer version, so that'll have like a built-in dimmer, whereas this just has some relays, and then the boiler one potentially has a temperature sensor in it. This is just the standard light switch three relay version. I imagine it's probably similar if you wanted to flash different firmware. I imagine the front part's probably the same, it's just different relays and stuff, but yeah, there are a few versions of this, so you could potentially try the other ones, but obviously bear in mind that 
you may have issues. This is the only one I've tested with. And finally you get a pair of screws. Now, one warning I will say with these is these look like self-tapping screws anyway, but chances are these aren't going to be the right size for a UK Patras box. In fact, I'll quickly check just for a laugh because this is something that I've seen with a lot of these sort of off-brand smart home products. If you look at the Patras box here and screw that in there, yep, that's not the right size. That's too big. Generally in the UK, Patras boxes use M3.5 screws, whereas a lot of these devices come with M4 screws, which is what I suspect this will be. So it's quite important not to use the screws it comes with if you're mounting into a Patras box, because at least in the UK, because what you'll end up doing is you'll get the screw in, but you'll then destroy the screw thread in your Patras, and then when you want to mount something else on it in the future, you then won't be able to do it without rethreading it. And I don't even know if you can rethread if you've stretched out with one of these. So yeah, don't use the screws it comes with. Just get a couple of M3.5 screws, really just the standard screws that would come with any sort of sockets. You might have spares, but just something like that. That's when you want to use. Don't use the screws it comes with. Just a sort of warning there before you someone forces screws in and breaks their patras. Because especially if that's plastered into a wall, that's not fun to replace. Yep, yeah, that's all the accessories. So now the important part is the switch itself. So as I mentioned, it comes in two parts. You've got the main screen here, which is just a touchscreen on the front. There's a protective film on it, we'll take off later. Around the back you'll see this little connector there, which is all labelled. We'll actually be using this to flash the firmware. So even though we're going to pop it open just to take a look inside, you actually don't need to. You don't need to solder anything. You can actually just flash the firmware just by plugging into this pin header here, which is really nice. And a few screws to open it up, so I'll do that later. And then down here, you get the back panel. This obviously connects onto this with that pin header, and essentially all you do is you mount this in your wall, put this over it, and then just slide it down. And then it engages that contact and it's all assembled, and to take it off you just lift that off and it comes off. So you would screw this into a normal Patras box, pin header here to connect up, and then round the back you'll see you have some connections. So you've got essentially live and neutral in, so this will need a neutral at your switch, and then you've got three live outs. That's because this has three built-in relays. So even though in my setting, I'm just going to use it as a touchscreen, I'm not going to use the relays built-in at all, it does have three built-in relays. So you could actually, with custom firmware, potentially control these as well. So you could actually have it that this could actually switch three different loads from it. I'm not going to do that, but it does have three built-in relays that go to these outputs here. And these will just switch the incoming live to the whichever output you're using. So they could be useful, but I'm not going to use them. I'm just going to feed live and neutral into this, power it, and that's it. But yeah, that's it there. Now at this point there's one quick quality control issue I want to point out here, just because I couldn't in good conscience continue with this video without mentioning it. And that is that I bought two of these. One of them powered up absolutely fine out of the box, the other one didn't. And then I sort of started like, you know, I was like, what, what's wrong, so maybe my connection was loose, I tightened it up, and then it sort of worked again, I was like, okay that's working, it must be a loose connection. And then I think I chucked it down on the, on the floor and then picked it up again later and it was not working again, and I moved the wires and it started working again. So I was about to just sort of send it back as a faulty unit, but I decided to pop it open because essentially here you've got this little clipped in panel and if you use a screwdriver there you can le lever that out and this slides out to expose the power supply and relay board, which to be honest seems like a decent enough design and it's very sim similar to the thermostat I've been using for a long time. However in here you'll see you have some solder joints and these connect onto the connectors at the back. The one here and the one here, the, le the two, two leftmost ones, they're the live and neutral in. And for some reason, on one of mine, in fact, I think it was this one, those didn't have any solder on it. The others were all soldered in, just not those two. There was just literally no solder on those solder joints. So it just wasn't making a connection. And obviously when I was moving it, it was potentially sort of making contact with the edge of the hole and powering it. So that's not good. Now, I should have probably returned it and that would have been sensible, but I couldn't be bothered. I had a soldering iron handy, so I wanted to take it apart anyway to pull the board out. So I just took it apart, soldered it, and that fixed it. So... There's no problem there now, and from what I can see, the design looks okay. Now I'm not Big Clive, I'm not an electronics expert, but I can't really fault the design here too much, it looks safe enough. But that is just a sort of warning I would say, is that at least with mine, one of them was perfectly fine, the other one was missing solder joints, so I would definitely check it if you did get one, because you've got the risk that if that was making a connection without solder that wasn't very good, it would probably be fine to power this. But then if you started powering a high current light load through it with a bunch of light bulbs, then you could potentially put quite a lot of current through that dodgy joint and then it could start heating up and spark and fire and bad things and then plastic box and yeah, you know, it's not good. So I'm still continuing with the project because I fixed it now and I'm still happy with this product. It hopefully was just a bad batch or just a bad one-off product that I had. 
All the, the other ones are absolutely fine. I've not seen other reviews complaining about it. But yeah, I would just definitely recommend popping open and just checking those soldier joints just in case there's, you know, a batch that's gone out into the wild that's got that missing and I happen to get one of them. So yeah, just a heads up there. But yeah, other than that, it's a fairly neat design and I'm, I can't really fault it at all. You've got your three relays in there, which are, what are they rated at? Five volt relays rated at 10 amps. So yeah, 10 amp relays. Decently specced, especially if you're switching lights. I mean, in the UK, this is going to be on a six amp circuit, so that's more than enough. So yeah, that's that's that there. So that clips back in there. And then what we've got is the screen itself. So on the front, you've got this little touchscreen. Around the back, you've got this connector. And what we'll do quickly before we power it up is we'll pop it open, take a look inside, and then we'll power it up. So to pop it open is dead simple, it's just a few little Phillips screws around the side of it, so we'll just take them out. And as I mentioned, you don't actually need to do this to flash it at all. You do just need to literally connect onto those pin headers, although it is a little bit fiddly to get them in if the back's on because of the angle, but yeah, you can actually do it without. And I'll show that in this video. But if we pop these all out... Take those screws out. The cover just lifts off, hopefully. Yep, there we go. And then you need to be a little, little bit careful because there is an antenna connected onto the back case. That could be unclipped from the case, but I'm actually just going to literally disconnect it from the module because that's easier. But yeah, you've got a little antenna on the back case there for Wi-Fi. That was nice enough to see. And then finally here, you've got the internals. And it's actually kind of interesting because there is an antenna on this board here, so they've actually seemingly put an antenna on the external case for like better signal because there is actually an antenna in the PCB trace down here too. But what we'll do now is we'll go in closer and take a look at what the hardware is. So here we can now see the inside of it. And what you'll notice is this is really, really simple. There's not much going on here, which makes it really easy to work with with custom firmware. There's other products out there such as the Sonoff NS panel, which I do want to get at some point. I'll probably do a video on that. But that has a separate HMI display, so the display essentially has its own microcontroller. And then you've almost got two different microcontrollers you need to flash with firmware. You need to flash one with the UI and then the other one with like the MQTT stuff. And there's a protocol between them. With this, it's dead simple. You've got the SPI LCD, which connects up here over this connection, and that will just be an SPI connection with power. You've got a few RGB LEDs around the outside. You probably can't see them. Um, can't quite figure out where they are, but they're just like dotted around the outside um, to sort of gl glow through the casing. So there's a few LEDs, but are there again just going to be standard RGB LCD LEDs. Your big pin header here that connects into the power supply board. And then the only real chip of significance is this module here. And this is an ESP32 W Rover IB. And this is a very, very common chip, and it's a bit like an ESP8266, just a bit more powerful. What this is, it has an ESP32 CPU in it, that handles all the Wi-Fi, it's the main CPU, you can flash firmware onto it. It has obviously the built-in Wi-Fi antenna with the connection for the external one. And then all it has is an absolute ton of external GPIO. Some of this GPIO is already used, so some of these will connect out to the relays, some of these will connect to the LCD for SPI, stuff like that. Some of these will be broken out as a serial connection to this pin header, which is what we'll use to flash. But the, I think there's a couple of, ext of extra GPIOs on here that aren't used, so even though there's not much space in the casing, there is reasonable scope for modification. You could possibly fit extra devices into this. But the key thing with this is because this is such a standard, common, off-the-shelf module, it's dead easy to flash custom firmware onto this. You know, it's designed for this sort of thing. You can literally buy this as like an Arduino-type sized module. So it's perfectly flashable for hobbyist use. You're not relying on some weird exploit that allows you to flash custom firmware through some exploit in the existing firmware. You, you literally shot a pin out to put it into programming mode, plug in the serial header, and use standard software to write the firmware to it, as we'll see. Now, the other component of note is down here, and it's labelled R45. And I can't work out what it is. It might, it looks like a tiny little capacitor or something. Obviously, it wouldn't be if it's an R45. But one thing I could see online, but in particular on the OpenHasp wiki, is that some versions of this come with a temperature sensor down here, essentially like a little thermistor. Apparently on mod more modern revisions they took that out, but it may be a case that you might get an older model that might have a thermistor there, or you might get the central heating variant which may also have it there, and you could use that to sense room temperature. Now I don't know if that is one on here, I can't 
white tell, I don't know what component that is. If it is, then great, I've got a thermistor on it. And if it isn't, you might still get that with the pads down there, you can potentially solder something on yourself. Because it is a very flexible device, you know, that'll just connect up to the GPIOs. You can kind of modify it quite a little bit. But yeah, that's the inside of it there. Not going to go into too much more detail, but yeah. Very standard ESP32 module that's easy to flash and an SPI LCD screen. And that's literally all you're getting. You're basically getting the equivalent of building it yourself with an ESP32 and SPI LCD, except it comes with a nice little mains power supply that's easy enough to use. And it's all built into a nice little enclosure so you don't need to try and make your own in 3D print and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, pretty neat little device. So all we'll do now is we'll just reassemble it all and then we'll fire it up. So we'll need to carefully connect that antenna cable on there. There we go. Put that on the back there. Screw it all back together. We'll then power it up just to take a look at the stock interface just before I flash it. We'll quickly flash the firmware and then we'll take a look at what it's capable of. Okay, so now let's power this up with the stock firmware just to take a look at it. So all I've done is I've just wired a bit of mains flex into the back there. Not the safest thing in the world, but I know what I'm doing, so I'm just going to do that, obviously. Don't do things like this if you're not confident. Really, this project, only do it if you're confident working with mains electrics and you know how to do it safely because, yeah, you are having to do mains electrical stuff, but we'll just do that for now. Obviously, it'll eventually be installed properly in the wall. Just wired into a plug for now, so we'll plug that in and power it up. So we can turn on there. That's the Lanbon screen. Make a smart living. That's not up, and there we go. It's just initialising. So that's it come on. Now obviously there's you could connect this up to the Wi-Fi by scanning a QR code or something and you know it'll connect to their cloud. I'm not gonna bother doing that. Also, it's got some sort of current monitoring, which is nice, so you can actually potentially monitor the current drawn through it. Don't know how accurate that is, but it does have it. And essentially what you've got is three different buttons here, so light one, light two, light three. And that literally just controls the relay. So you might not hear it on camera because my microphone's not close to it, but when I click these, you can hear the relays clicking on and off at the back. And that's literally all it really does. I think if you click, is it up here somewhere? Or hold? Yeah, if you hold up there, you get this UI that looks, it looks pretty horrific. But yeah, you can do like Wi-Fi config. You can connect it to the Wi-Fi. I think there's a QR code you can scan to do that. Or that, I don't know, I think it maybe access an access point. Linkage config system info you can go into. It shows sort of information about it. It does say mesh mode in there. Maybe it does do mesh Wi-Fi. I don't know. Interestingly, device temperature actually does show up, so maybe it does have a temperature sensor. That'd be quite cool. Obviously, it's not connected to the Wi-Fi or anything, but it is there. Some sort of host, obviously, it'll connect to it. You know, so it's, it's this is a stock firmware. It's not great. The layer, so you can potentially set some sort of time delay thing. You know, looks very sort of homebrew as, as it is. You know, switch underscore A. You know, that on like a public on a sort of you know retail product. There's a timer on there, but. Yeah, it's got this sort of functionality, but you kind of get the idea of this is the sort of functionality this product has. And you can see why it maybe doesn't get the best reviews on Amazon. Like, it works, and you can maybe set timers. I suppose you can control it remotely, but it doesn't, it doesn't really offer much benefit over a traditional smart switch other than being able to, like, set the timers on this device itself, you know. If I, had, if I wanted just a typical smart switch with relays in it, I'd rather have something where I can set the timers on an app and have physical switches rather than have the ability to set timers on this touchscreen, but then have to rely on like pressing these to control my lights as a primary source of control. But yeah, that's the stock firmware there. I think also actually just for a laugh, you can also like change the theme on it. There's some pretty pretty horrific looking themes on here. I think setting, yeah, theme and style. Yeah, you can change like the background picture to that and then theme to like theme A is a bit, yeah, you can have some pretty horrific styles like where is someone going to use that? But, you know, it is there. I think you can also rename these switches um, somewhere. Temperature calibration. Interesting home assistant support. That's kind of cool, but I don't know what that will actually do. But yeah, there's no way I would want to use this stock firmware. It looks pretty horrific, but it does have it. I think you can also actually turn it into like a curtain switch. You can do that and then... Yeah, you can do that. You can actually set it up to act like work like a curtain switch. So you'll, you'll press a button to open or close the curtains. It'll click a relay on for a period of time to operate a motor and then it'll click it off again to turn it off. Some do some sort of calibration because it thinks there's curtains attached. You get the idea. That's a stock firmware. I'm not reviewing this product as it is because this firmware seems pretty horrific. 
may be useful for curtain stuff, but yeah, I don't really know why I'd want to use a firmer on this. But it doesn't really matter because, well, the firmer is coming off it very soon, so I kind of wanted just to show the firmer before I nuke it. Yep, orbit time calibration complete. Is it frozen? There we go. Go out of that. Home. Ah, there you go. There's your curtain control. So now you can sort of say, open the curtains, close the curtains. That way, controlling different relays, one to move the motor in each direction. Stop it when you do that. It does a countdown for while the motor would be operating. Interesting little device, but yeah, definitely not something I would be using. So yeah, time to turn this off for the last time and flash the firmware. Okay, so now we're ready to flash the firmware. So to do this, all you need is a standard USB TTL serial adapter, so I'm just using the one I've used before. The one thing to bear in mind is this obviously has, like lots of these, it has 3.3 volts serial pins, so you kind of want one that's voltage switchable. I've seen some people say that it's maybe 5 volt tolerant, but I just use this adapter here where you can use a simple jumper there to switch it between 3.3 volts and 5 volts, so that's going to use 3.3 volts on the serial lines. So that'll plug into, into USB and give me a TTL serial connection. And then I've got it connected up to the pins on the device here. It potentially could be easier if you took the back plate off, but I just wanted to show doing it without that. All I just used was standard sort of dew point style connectors. I had to bend some of the pins to get it in, but they all connected in fine. And this is all documented on the open hasp sort of documentation page for this device, so it's pretty easy to do. Essentially, all I've got connected into here is transmit and receive for the serial. That's connected up to this, so transmit on the L8 is connected to receive on this, and receive on this is connected to transmit on the LH, just to switch them around. Ground is connected up to this. You can then either connect the power supply to 5 volts or 3.3 volts. There's two different pins here, one for 5 volt, one for 3.3. Both should work. I've used 5 volts for powering it. It's still 3.3 volt data lines, but I'm using 5 volts to power it, just because that means the LCD also powers up. If you use 3.3 volts, it only powers up the ESP, and I was worried that it was maybe going to I don't know, back feed the LCD and then cause voltage drop or something. So I'd say just feed it from 5 volts and that was safer. Plus it meant that if it did, if it did boot up into standard firmware, you could easily see because the LCD would work. So I've connected the 5 volt up there. And what you'll see is one extra cable here and I'll explain that in a second. So as it is now, if I plug it into the laptop here and you can see I've got a I've got Minicom open to show a serial console, plug that in there. What you'll see is you'll see the device will start up as normal. And you'll see it'll actually output a lot of debug information. So it's interesting to see actually the default firmware will actually output a lot of debug information over serial as it boots up. But as you can see, that's not ideal because it, well, it's booting up into the standard firmware. It's also quite interesting, you can see it says like two year module not, not exists. So it obviously is designed the firmware to talk to a two year module if it's installed. So yeah, it's kind of cool. But yeah, so that's showing it's booting up into the default firmware, which you don't want because you can't flash it if it's doing this. So instead, what you need to do is there's one extra GPIO connection you need, that you need. On this connector here, you'll see there's one extra pin labelled IO0. It's sort of buried under, so you won't be able to see it, but you might be able to refer back to the earlier footage. But all you need to do is connect IO0, which is GPIO0, to ground, and that'll put it into programming mode. So for that, I've just got another cable here, and all I've got is a, another pin here, and I just bodged it. I just jam it into the sort of hole on the ground terminal. It doesn't really need to be a good connection. It literally just needs to sense it's pulled to ground, so... I found jamming that in there was perfectly sufficient, obviously. Much easier to do off camera, but I got that absolutely fine earlier, so I just need to jam that in there just to make at least some sort of ground connection. There we go, I've just butchered it and just shoved the ground, shoved it into the back of that ground connection. It doesn't need to really be a good connection, because as long as it's there when it first powers on, it'll go into programming mode. So now what we'll find is Minicom is still open. If we plug this in here this time, it won't output anything, it won't boot into normal firmware, so we plug that in there. Nothing comes up in the serial console, and you'll see the LCD comes on, and otherwise it looks dead. But that's because it's booted up into programming mode, so the firmware isn't running. So all we now need to do is flash OpenHasp onto this while it's sitting in this mode. Okay, so now we're ready to flash the firmware. And for this, we're just using ESP tool, which is a standard Python script that's very commonly used for flashing ESPs. And this is all documented on the OpenHasp sort of documentation pages, although it's very common for a lot of other devices with a lot of custom firmware. I think Tasmota and stuff's very similar. So what we've got here is we've got ESP tool installed, and we've got the serial port that this adapter showing up as, and we're running the flash ID command. We don't need to do this, but this will just get info of the device and just check the serial connection is working. So if we run that, there we go, it's connected there. And as you can see, it's worked. It's detected 8 megabytes of flash, 40 megahertz crystals, done all that. So yeah, it's correctly detected the chip, so that's really good. So we know it is working. 
run again. You can see the connection's still up. Yep, it's still working. I've had devices before where you run that once and you need to restart it, but it seems to be working absolutely fine. So the next command we need to do is just to write the flash. Okay, so now it's done. We need to raise the flash. So we're using this command here, which is just ESP tool, serial port, and erase flash. This is a scary one because this should erase the original flash memory. Let's do that there. Let that run. That'll sit for a little minute. No status updates normally because sometimes it's nice if you at least get a status update, but there we go. That's it done. So that's now cleared it. Okay, so now that we've erased the flash, we now need to write the firmware. So we've got this command here, very similar to the one before, it's all documented, but ESP tool, there's a serial port, it's the write flash command, write to that memory location, just 0x0, and there's a firmware image. So now with the device sitting in firmware mode, with the or firmware flashing mode with the um, ground shorted out, or that pin shorted to ground, we can run it. So run that command, see it'll connect, and it'll start writing the firmware. And you obviously see down here, if you look at the serial adapter, you'll see the transmit LED is flashing away, and then occasionally the receive LED blinks as it's you know updating the status on the screen. So it's it's worth getting one of these adapters that has the LEDs on it because you can actually view the status without having to rely on the program outputting anything. But yeah, we can see it's uploading the firmware to it, so now we just literally need to wait. It doesn't take too long. The documentation did show specifying a baud rate, but when I did that, the program just the script just threw an error, so I don't know. So I'm just doing it whatever the default baud rate is, which so it will be quite slow, but. You only need to do it once, so it's not too bad. So yeah, we just need to wait for that firmware to write across. It will try powering it up and see if it works. Or if I've just bricked the device and I'm out and I'm down 50 quid, but hopefully not. Okay, and that's it done. So you now see it's written the firmware out, verified the hash, and it's now reset the device. So that should be done. Now, if you look at the device still, it's just going to be sitting on the white screen because it's got that I.O. pin shorted to ground. But all we now need to do is if we take this out of here, disconnect the USB pin, We'll remove that short, that link that's putting it into debug mode, and just to test it will power it up from USB. So we'll plug this in here, see if it works for the first time. Plug that in there, and in theory this should boot into OpenASP. There we go, so that's OpenASP starting up. And if I were to use Minicom, you'd be able to see a bit of serial output. It does output some slight serial stuff as it boots up, but that's it there. So it's now saying it's, oh, tap screen set up Wi-Fi, whoops, but it was broadcasting an SSID there, so you can connect an access point and then you can, you know, set it up from your phone, or you can tap on the screen, enter your SSID and password in there on a very tiny little keyboard, and then, yep, connect it to the Wi-Fi that way. So what I'll do is I'll get this put onto its main power supply base, just so we're not using this janky USB setup, power it up, get it set up on the Wi-Fi, and then we'll write some UI for it. Okay, so I'm now connected to the Wi-Fi. I just actually used the on-screen keyboard. It was very fiddly, but it did work. And it was nice not having to use a phone to go to the, you know, the web interface on it. It was just nice just being able to type the SSID and password in on here. But now if we power it on, it'll be up into OpenHasp. So turn it on. Comes up the OpenHasp boot screen again as before. And then now you're seeing the default UI, which just has the word plate on it. This is just a UI element. So yeah, and I think plate is what they're referring to this. This is a plate. And if we wait a few seconds, it takes a little while, you'll get a message popping up with an IP address, and that's the IP address of this device, and that comes up every time you turn it on. That is configurable, you can turn it off, and we'll take a quick look at the configuration. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on how this is configured, because there's you know, proper documentation on it, but we'll do a quick tour once I've set it up of how my setup works. So I'll go away off camera, set this up, and I'll show it actually working, because realistically, once you get the initial setup done, you know that's when it's interesting, otherwise the out-of-box config's a bit boring. But what I'll quickly do is I'll take my phone here and I'll quickly go to that IP address. 215, I think it was. Of course, it's now gone off the screen. But. 2.215. There we go. And there is OpenHasp. So there's the UI there. You can see it's on my phone. See a screenshot. That'll show a screenshot of what's on the screen right now. And yeah, that's the OpenHasp screen. There's information here about where you configure things like MQTT and stuff, which is obviously. I'll need to do. But what I'll do is I'll go way off camera, build a UI on it, and then come back and demonstrate it. Okay, so here we are in OpenHasp. So I've now connected the device to the network, I've actually installed it in the wall and everything, and I've gone to its IP address. And as you can see, you get this sort of configuration screen very similar to things like Tasmota. I'll do this in two stages. I'll go through and do a very quick tour of the UI, then I'll go away and show actually what I've built on the device, show the actual interface I've designed. Then we'll come back and take a look at how I've defined all that and configured it, and then we'll see it working in practice. So first of all, you get this UI here. There's a bunch of different sections. So you've got Hasp Design where you can go in here and you can sort of change the theme and stuff like that. 
You've got a screenshot, which just shows a screenshot of the device. I think it's currently turned off, hence why there's nothing there, or it's maybe a browser incompatibility. But yeah, you get a screenshot of it. Information shows sort of system information. C configurations where you set up things like Wi-Fi, where you can set up HTTP stuff, for, for example, a password for the web interface. You can set the MQTT settings, which is quite important. So here I've given it a name so I can identify it under the MQTT topics. And then the broker connection information, obviously a password if you needed that. Settings for the display, such as the idle time. So you can set up different times. And basically all it means is when the device is idle, it sends an event over MQTT. So it sends an event when it's been idle for a short period of time, and then another event when it's been idle for a long period of time, in this case, five and 10 seconds. So I can use that in my case to dim the display, but you could do other stuff based on this. You can rotate the display, put a pointer, various things like that, but this is all sort of fine, just left as default. There's settings for GPIO as well. So for example, you could add a pin input and you could say, put different options on here, various types of devices. So this is what you could do if you were to wire onto additional GPIO pins on that ESP32 board. You can actually wire up these additional GPIO pins. You can see there's a big list of them here, the ones that are available. Some of these are, yep, they're all available here. So you can pick the GPIO pin. You can sign different things. So you can sign inputs. You can also sign outputs, so for example, LEDs and stuff like that. These mood LEDs, these are the LEDs that surround the device. So they're built in. They're like sort of a little border that lights up on it. I've not really used them, but you could actually set these up as GPIOs and then presumably control them over MQTT, although I've not tried that. But yeah, that's all there. Go to the main menu again. There's an option to do it with OTA firmware upgrades as well. But the main thing you'll find is this file editor. And this is how it's all defined. So if you come into here, there's a couple of JSON files as to how it's configured. So this one, which will just define the overall config that I think is what you can configure in that web interface. And then additionally, you've got these offline command and online command. These define what basically happens when the device goes online or goes offline. So when it goes offline, it would display it, it's, it'll display a message box just saying it's offline. And when it comes online, this is when it connects to the network, it will display a message box showing the IP address. So this is basically what you see when it turns on. As you saw in the demonstration, when it turns on, it displays a message showing its IP address, which is done by this here. And it also closes after presumably 20 seconds, but you could take that out, that out if you didn't want it. I've also got this line here, which is server stop console. This was an issue I had, um, and it, this did seem to help, which basically, this device has a serial console on it. So you can connect up to a serial port header and actually get a console and change settings and stuff like that over the serial console. However, there was a bug I found that was people were describing on GitHub, where what seemed to be happening is when that serial console is not connected, RF noise or something gets into it and essentially starts typing random characters into that serial console. And after a period of time, it must fill up a buffer or something and crash the device and cause it to lock up. Presumably, if it just sends enough nonsense characters in without a new line, it'll eventually just fill up a buffer, I don't know. So the device would just put this in here, it basically says, when it connects to the network, stop the serial console. So that solves that problem. But it means that when it's not connected to the network, the serial console is active, so I could use it to fix the Wi-Fi settings, but that's a bit more of an advanced thing. That's just helps solve a problem we had. Then the final file we have here is pages.json.l, and this is a JSON that describes the user interface. So what we'll quickly do now is we'll jump over and take a look at the UI itself, see what I've built, show it all off because it is quite cool, and then we'll very quickly jump back into this just to see what, just so I can roughly describe how it's all defined here because it's easier to do this after you've seen what the UI looks like. So let's jump over to the touch screen and see what the UI looks like. Okay, so that's it all now installed. Obviously don't attempt this if you're not confident with electrics and you don't know how to do it safely and obviously based on regulations in your own country. But it wasn't too painful to do. If you've seen my previous video, you'll have seen where I built these smart switches where I've got a retractor switch module that connects a son off in the back box behind here. And this just talks over MQTT to control the lights. And there's a key switch module here that powers the son off and the smart bulbs. That key switch now also powers the touch panel. So essentially I've got a piece of twin nerf, one mil that comes out of this up the touch panel and that's connected to the neutral and the switched output of the switch. So the switch will control power to this as well. And to mount this, I've just used a standard Patras box, but in this case, I've done something a little bit different because normally there's no batten or anything behind here. So normally I'd be using a plastic dry lining box. You know, it's what I use for everything else if I don't have a bit of wooden batten. However, because this does have like an active power supply behind it, there's active circuitry in there. It is a slightly cheap off brand device. I felt a bit more confident with a metal box, just in case it did melt or catch fire or something. I'd rather there's a metal box behind it rather than the plastic one. So for that, I'm using one of these, which is a Click Flame Guard, I think it's called. Essentially, it's a dry lining box. So, you know, it's got these standard sort of dry lining style lugs that spring out to grip the plasterboard. But it's metal and it's got an intermittent pad in the back. 
Now, I don't need the intermittent pad. That's more like if you're installing this in a say a fire rated plasterboard wall. The reason I've just done this is just so it's a metal box really. It just means that if this did melt, catch fire, whatever, it's at least contained inside a metal box. Now, these are a bit more expensive than the traditional dry lining box and they're okay. Um, I'm not, the quality's not amazing. They've got quite a lot of very sharp sort of little burrs on it and the earth lug has a tendency to spin when you screw it in, which isn't ideal. I see lots of people raving about click products, but I've had a lot of issues with this and a bunch of sockets, so I'm not overly sure. But yeah, it's fine. Um, and it just at least gives me a metal box behind it. The only other thing to watch out for is that this has 25mm knockouts. There's no 20mm knockouts, so I had a bit of fun when I went to fit this and didn't actually have an appropriately sized grommet, so I had to go and get 25mm grommets. But yeah, I decided to use this just as a slightly more fireproof alternative. I'm not buying it as a fully fire rated box, even though it is. I just felt it was a bit safer having it in this than in a plastic box, but yeah, that was more me being paranoid than anything else. But yeah, that's touchscreen installed there. And I think it looks really, really neat. So yeah, that's it on the wall. So what we'll do is we'll quickly go through and take a look at the user interface. We'll watch it control some of the lights just to see roughly how it works. And yeah, then I'll give my thoughts on it. Okay, so now here we can see the interface I've come up with. You'll notice it's quite dull, but what you can do is you can use over MQTT, you can adjust the brightness of it. So I've got it set up that if the lights are on, after a period of time, it dims down to a lower level, but the screen stays on just so you can see that it's on. However, if the lights are off, after a period of time, it totally turns off until you touch it again. However, if you interact with the lights in any way, so say I, even if I press the physical switch below it, it will brighten up to full brightness, like that. But what we're going to do is we can go through, take a look at the interface, and then I'll show it working. So, it does time out quite quickly, so I'll need to be careful, but on the first screen here, we can see we have this quick options screen. On here, we've got a few scenes. We've got warm white, cool white, night light, and off. Warm white turns the room onto a sort of warm white style and it sort of dims the lights towards the front of the room so the front rows of down lights at the TV are dimmer than the back row. That's generally what I use if I'm in the room at night. It's a nice comfortable light to sit under. Next up we've got cool white. This sets all the lights to maximum brightness and does a very cool daylight style light sort of colour temperature. That's ideal if I'm in the room during the day there's light coming in the window but it's a little bit dull and I want natural or artificial light to reinforce the light coming in the window but if I want it to still kind of feel like daylight, so that's what I use there. Then there's night light, which turns everything fully dull and a very warm colour temperature, which is basically if I like, need to come into the room late at night, I've lost something or whatever, and I don't want to be blinded, I can turn that on. And then off, which admittedly I don't really need because I do have the physical switch down here and I could probably have one of these turned off when I've turned it on, but it currently does that. There's lots of room for tweaks. Then we've got sliders for brightness and colour temperature. These just slide along. I won't alter it because otherwise the, the lights in the room will change, but I can do that. And then there's buttons down the bottom here that navigate between different pages. So we go to the next page. And now this one offers, has a drop down for brightness scene and colour scene. So brightness scene allows me to pick different ways of fading the down lights. So all just makes them all full brightness. Fade to front will make the lights at the front of the room darker than the lights at the back of the room, which is nice because the TV's at the front of the room. Single rear row turns the rear row of down lights on and the other one's off. It's fairly self-explanatory. That's brightness scene. Colour scene is how I make switch between the RGB lights, so I can do that, where all just makes them all white. Checkerboard sort of does checkerboard pattern of colours between two colours, and coloured rear just makes the rear row of LEDs colourful, and then the rest stay on white to sort of, you know, give a bit colour in the room but still have white light. We'll show these working later. And on the final screen, We've actually got some colour pickers, so I can actually use this to even pick the colours of lights in the room from this without needing my phone, which is fantastic. So yeah, that's the interface there. So what we'll now do is we'll take a look at it working. But before we do that, what we'll do is we'll jump back over to the JSON file, show how this UI is configured just now you've seen it, take a look at how it works over MQTT very quickly, and then we'll come back and show it all working in practice. So here we are back at the JSON file. And now you've seen the UI, this is actually probably fairly simple. Essentially, each line is a JSON object, and each JSON object just describes an item on the screen. Each of these is also assigned to a page, so the pages have numbers, and that's the pages that are switched through on the bottom of the screen. So first of all, we have this, which is page zero. These are all common elements. So these are the sort of things that show up on every single page. So that's things such as the, let's see what we have here. Um, that's these, which are the symbols. These are the bottom navigation buttons. So that's the left arrow, the home button, and the right arrow. That's what these Unicode characters are. Then this is the sort of bar border at the top of the screen. 
This is how we define the start and end page limits. So when we press the next button on the final page, it wraps back around to the front. Essentially what you see is on page one, the previous page is page three, and on page three, the previous page, the, the next page is page one, and that does the wraparound. This is all described in the documentation. And here we can see how we define these pages. So for example, here we have the first page. We have this label object here that has a text quick options, and that's positioned at the top of the screen. We then have these button objects here for warm white, cool white, night light, and off. These are positioned based on these sort of pixel coordinates here, so you basically manually position things on the screen. Of course, the screen's a single size, so you can do that without worrying about it wrapping or anything. And we set the background color of the off button to red. We have a, we have a label that says brightness, and then a slider for the brightness, a label that says color temperature, and a slider for the color temperature. That's all on page one. The next page, we then have the text at the top of the screen that says scenes, the brightness scene, and then a drop down. And in the drop down, all you do is you put the options parameter and just supply all your options separated by new line characters. Same for color scene. And then for the color pickers, essentially we have a color picker object positioned at a certain point on the screen. And what you'll notice is that each of these objects has a page number, which as I mentioned is used for the pagination, and an ID number. The IDs have to be unique to a page, so they don't have to, so you have like ID 10 on page one and ID 10 on page two, but you couldn't have two elements with the same ID on the same page. And that's because these IDs are, and page numbers are used combined to, to create the MQTT topic. So if you pull over MQTT Explorer here, we can see we have some messages. So these ones have already gone away and done. So you can see here we have HASP is the sort of base topic for OpenHASP. Living room is a device we have. We can open up state. We can see it's been idle for a long period of time. We can see the history of this is it was off, so it wasn't idle. Then it was idle for a short period of time. Now it's been idle for a long period of time because I've not been using it. See it's on page one. The backlight's on a very low brightness. And then we can see these topics that have been published to when I've interacted with it. So the sort of syntax for the topic is page is P, the page number, B, and then the item number. So for example, P1B23 is page one, ID 23, which is the button for off. P1B20 is page one, ID 20, which is the button for warm white. And as you can see, there's been two events, which was an up event, a down event, followed by an up event. So that's basically, I've clicked that button, I've clicked, so I've clicked the warm white button and the off button. When you first touch it, it sends a down event. When you release it, it sends an up event. And then for a different type of item we have here, we have P1B31, which is page one, item 31, which is the brightness slider. And as you can see, as this gets changed, the event is either changed when the value is changed and then it's up when you release your finger, and it publishes a value attribute. And as you can see, the values changed. So it was 94, and then it's changed 254 for the full brightness. So that's me changing the brightness. So this is obviously very simple. It just publishes these updates to MQTT. And then if I were to publish to any of these topics, so if I were to say publish a different value to P1B31, that will update the slider on the UI. And we'll show that in a minute. I'll show how that updates. But it's very easy because all it means is this will publish is any control you interact with on the touchscreen will publish to MQTT. And then if you publish back to any of those topics, it will update the UI on the touchscreen itself. So you can keep them in sync, which is good. But yeah, it's relatively simple. And then all I've done is I've integrated this into, into Node-RED. I won't show the Node-RED flow fully because it is a bit complicated, but I'll quickly bring it in just to show a very rough example of how it works. So here's a sort of very lightweight thing of how it works for living room lighting. It's a bit of a mess, so I'm not really going to easily explain it, but essentially what you can see here is we have a panel button for warm white. We filter for the down event, so we filter for that being clicked down, and then that sets a bunch of things. So it sets things such as all for the colour scene, it sets the, it turns the lights on, and it sets the colour temperature and stuff like that. And then for things such as the sliders, we have, where would it be? We have the brightness slider, which is somewhere. I've lost it, that's not very helpful. There we go. So we have the, bright, the panel slider for brightness here. That outputs a brightness value and feeds it into the brightness control, which is a J, which is a node red UI element. And then the output of that brightness slider in the node red UI, which is a web interface element, feeds back into the panel slider MQTT topic, which you can see here. And that means when I adjust the slider in the node red UI, that also updates the slider on the touchscreen. So that's how it works, basically. All the buttons just basically feed straight into node red and go through the flow. But anything that's kind of that's got a state on the touch screen, so the brightness slider or the color scene drop downs, 
they've got an input into Node-RED and then an output from Node-RED again. So if I change it within Node-RED, it will also feed that output back out to the panel. So yeah, my Node-RED setup is very confusing. I could maybe one day do a full walkthrough of how it all works for people interested in that. But that's a very rough sort of demonstration of how it all works. But yeah, that's the UI. So what I'll now do is we'll quickly take a look at how the touchscreen can be updated by Node-RED and vice versa. And then we'll do a full demo of how it all works. Now how this works over MQTT is really simple. Once the UI is defined, all that happens is when I press one of these buttons, it publishes to an MQTT topic, and there's a topic for each control. All the logic is done in Node-RED. So, you know, when I go through these pages, yes, the page, the pagination is done by this, but if I were to, for example, press one of these scenes buttons, you'll notice that if I say press cool white, you'll see the temperature adjust, or if I press night light, you'll see they'll both move. That's all done by Node-RED. So essentially what happens, is when I press a control on this, it publishes an MQTT topic, Node-RED responds to that, and then Node-RED publishes updates to all the topics of the controls it wants to change. And when this thing receives that update message, it updates the UI. So that also means if I were to say, take my phone here, and I were then to say, adjust the brightness, you'll notice that the brightness control on the touchscreen will update at the same time. So that's really good. I'm not tied into having this not reflect Node-RED, I can easily use both these together and they'll properly update each other, which is really, really good. Okay, so now let's take a look at this working. So what you'll notice is you've got obviously one camera filming the room and another camera just filming the touch panel so we can see what we're pressing. To roughly explain the lighting in this room, I'll probably do a video on it in more detail. We've got nine GU10 downlights in the ceiling. Each has an RGB smart bulb in it. And the way the work is sort of set up here is arranged in three different rows going towards the TV. There's then a lamp in that corner of the room a lamp in that corner of the room you can just about make out there, another lamp off here that you can't make out, but I can't get a wide enough angle shot, but you can kind of get a rough idea. But yeah, that's it there. So now if I were to come onto the touch panel, obviously I can turn it on and off just with the main switch down here, turns all the lights off, turns all the lights on as you'd expect, but with the touch panel I can control them. So if I press the warm white button, you'll notice it'll dim the front two rows and set them all to a warm colour temperature, which is what we have here. The, the white balance on the camera is not, probably not quite right, but it's quite a warm white, and the front two rows are dimmer. And this is a very nice light to li live under. If all the downlights are full brightness, it's very harsh and a bit too bright. So this is really nice. It makes it a little bit dimmer, a bit more comfortable to live under. But alternatively, we've got the cool white setting, which is what I use during the day if there's light coming in the window. So if we press that, you'll see they'll all come up to full brightness and they'll turn to a very cool white, which probably looks blue on the camera because the white balance is off, but that's now a very cool daylight type light. And it's very, very bright because all the front light, the, fr the front, rows have gone up to full brightness. Likewise, if we press night light, you'll see it'll all dim down to the lowest brightness setting and go very, very warm white. So this is really good at night if I'm just in the room, say I've been in bed and I've forgotten something, I need to turn the lights on in the living room but I don't want to get blinded, I can use this. I've also got full manual control here of brightness and colour temperature, so I can for example, turn the brightness up full. I can, that'll be full but warm white. I can slide colour temperature along to make it cooler. I can do it cool white, make it a bit duller. It's very, very customizable. So we just do warm white there just to sort of have a reasonable sort of scene. We can then look at the next page where we've got the brightness scene. So this defaults to fade to front if I've pressed warm white, but I can change that. So all will make everything full brightness. Single rear row will turn off the front two rows of lights. Two rear rows will turn on the two rear rows of lights. And two rear rows of faded mid will do the same, but it'll just dim the middle row a little bit. I don't use many of these, I really just use all or fade to front, but I kind of put them in just to try them out. This is directly lifted and shifted from what I had in Node-RED. This is the exact same sort of Node-RED interface I had on my Node-RED web UI that you've probably seen in previous videos. I've just transferred it onto this. And I still have the web UI so I can do my, use my phone as well. But yep, there's a brightness scene. And then finally the fun one is we have this colour scene. So we can do coloured rear, which as you'll see it will turn the rear row to be coloured, as well as the front and all, well, all the laps are in the room but it'll leave the other rows of lights on white just to get a bit more white light. So this is nice if I just want essentially like white light in the room, but I just want a little bit of colour accenting it. However, the other option is I can go here and I can go to checkerboard and that'll turn all the lights in the room into different colours. So essentially there's two different colours picked and it'll checkerboard them across. So like it'll alternate blue, pink, blue, pink all the way across the room. And I really like doing this because the problem with having a room that's got coloured lights is if you set all the lights to the same colour, you end up with everything that's coloured in the room just looking funny because there's not enough, you know, everything's red or everything's green and then anything that's 
blue won't show up, stuff like that. Whereas if you alternate between sort of two somewhat distinct colours like this, it means that in the room there's already a decent mix of red, green and blue. So stuff looks okay, like all the colours in the room look reasonably accurate. There's just a bit of extra colour, so actually alternating colours like this really, really helps. So yeah, that's checkerboard pattern, and I use this all the time. If I just want to sit in the room and relax, and maybe have something a bit nicer than like a super harsh white light, this is really, really nice to use. Of course, we can change the colours, so we can go in here, and we've got the two colour pickers, so I can go in here, I can pick green there, and I'll change them to green. I can pick green there, and you'll see the issue with having a single colour, it looks terrible. Um, and this is why I like mixing the colours up, likewise I said, right, make the whole room blue with both of them. It also looks funny because the whole room goes blue, like that, and it just feels horrible. But yeah, you can kind of mix the colours up like that, all pickable on this colour wheel, so it's really pretty easy to do. And it's just so nice having this on the wall. Now obviously I basically have it permanently stuck on that colour combination, just because it's the one I like the most, but it's so good being able to do this from the wall without having to talk to a voice assistant or, make, or have to get my phone out of my pocket. I can still do all this on my phone, and I have done, but it is nice not having to do it. So we can come back to here and obviously just use the switch in there to turn them all on and off, as, as you'd expect. But then because I've got these shortcuts, if I come into the room, turn the lights on, they've come all colourful because I've had them on colourful the night before, all I need to do is press cool white and then straight away they'll all turn back to normal cool white temperature. So, yep, this thing is super useful. And that's just a little tour of the UI. Obviously it's totally customizable, so really you can do whatever you want with this, but this is how I've got mine set up here, but I imagine I'll probably change this in the future just as my needs or preferences change. So there you go, that's a look at my touchscreen smart home control panel, built around a Lanbon L8 flashed with OpenHasp. And this is something I've wanted for so long and I'm so glad to finally have it. It's just great being able to take an off the shelf device, have the finished enclosure and all that sort of stuff, just slap it in the wall, but be able to flash the custom firmware on and design a UI like this. Because this now means that while I can still use my phone to control all these and, and a little bit more, I can just come into the room and just, you know, if I want to make lights colourful, I just come in here and press one button or a couple of buttons and it'll do it. And just the flexibility of this is incredible. It doesn't have to be restricted for lighting, you know, I could put heating controls into this. If I wanted to say have this act as like a let me change the temperature in a room, I could do that. Especially if I somehow bodged a temperature sensor into it, but you could just have a way to adjust the temperature in a room with an external temperature sensor. You could integrate it with some sort of, yeah, curtain control, blind control, you could have controls for that on here. I could have all that on this. I can add as many, many pages as I want, or at least within presumably the memory limits of this device. Add as many controls as I want, and it's just super flexible. And being able to define this UI with just pure JSON is super simple. So yeah, I'm really, really happy with how this works. So there you go, thank you very much for watching. If you're interested in trying this, I've put links down in the, in the description and in a pinned comment to buy the Lanbon L8. I will say it's potentially a bit risky because you are flashing custom firmware, there might be different revisions of this, there's nothing stopping them bringing out one that has a different chipset in it that isn't compatible. So you do kind of need to bear in mind that you might not get an absolutely perfect solution, but I've had very good luck with this and I'm so happy. So as long as you don't mind a little bit of a risk and you know what is essentially a hobbyist homebrew project, this could be a very viable option for many self-hosted smart homes. So yeah, thank you very much for watching, and also stand by for a few more smart home videos coming up. I've got a couple of little things in the pipeline I want to do, so yeah, definitely stay tuned for them as well. But yeah, thanks for watching.